Round nine is in the books, a shakeup at the top of the leaderboard. And these games just keep getting more instructive for everybody. Welcome to the candidates recap of round nine. We had Peter Svidler and Veslin Topalov going at it with colors reversed. Veslin was white. We had a attempted repeat of how Anand beat Svidler from earlier in the tournament, but Svidler changed things up. It didn't change the fact that he was under pressure big time, although in this case, Topalov was unable to come away with the full point. In the next game, we had Hikaru Nakamura and Sergei Karyakin show us that MVL's game of the day analysis is being followed closely, or he's just that good, and he predicted something that might actually happen in the tournament. We're going to break down what happened in their Queens Indian. The game of the day, as far as I was concerned, and the one that I spent most of my time analyzing, was when the Tiger from Madras, not Madrid, I will say it correctly this time, Madras, Madras, Vichy showed that he still has fangs, and they are sharp. The Tiger took down Aronian in a huge win that puts him right at the top of the leaderboard. And then finally, the game of the day was between Geary and Caruana, where the Dutchman was unable to convert on a seriously huge advantage and maybe costing himself his chances to win the candidates in the process. Who knows when all is said and done, but this was definitely the best chance he has had to date to come away with a full point and not just a half point. So unfortunately for him, he was not able to do it, but we will get to that at the end. Let's start right where I mentioned we have Topalov versus Svidler. And as I said, Topalov plays a Lopez trying to get the same type of um, attacking chances that Vichy was able to create against Svidler. And they repeated exactly that opening up until the moment here with A4, where Svidler decided he would not play Bishop to B7 and instead shows the move b4, which I think is probably a little bit worse than bishop b7. But maybe Svidler hadn't had the time. These guys only have limited resources available to them while they're actually at a tournament, when they don't have their full team sitting down and reviewing everything. Maybe didn't have the time to repeat what Vichy did against him, or, or just decided that it wasn't, wasn't what he wanted. And I think that b4 has the chance to give white more consistent advantages, and Topalov got one here today. But I'm no Rui Lopez expert. Let, let's just continue. After d3, h6, knight b to d2, this is all pretty standard stuff. Now, after the move d6 is played, you have a few different plans here for white. Uh, the plan chosen in the game for c3 and d4. The other plan that was executed by actually Alexandra Kostinyuk, who is one of the commentators for the official website, that's a plan that, that to show it, we're going to start with the move order rookie 8 and see knight comes to c4, and then the pawn comes to a5 at critical moments, and this has multiple purposes. One is to actually separate the b and the a pawns. As you can see, once they can no longer reconnect, that's not a functional relationship, and it maybe makes both of them targets in the long run. It also opens up the a4 square. So for example, after bishop to e6 offering the trade, Kostinyuk said, no thank you, and put the bishop on a4. And she ended up with a very clear advantage against Sabrina Foyser, and this was a tournament that was played just last November. So I think that this slower idea, the positional idea of bringing the knight to c4, maybe separating these two pawns, is another solid way for white to go. But in the game, Topolov seemed right at home in his preparation with the line that he chose, which happened after d6 and c3. But, but it was a much more dynamic affair. When h3 is played and now d4, white is officially giving up on this whole knight to c4 positional approach kind of business. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it was just a plan I wanted to highlight because I thought it was instructive for people to see. After d4, bishop to f8, we saw a5 anyway, but... Not exactly the same kind of long-term positional effects because as, as the tension has been created here in the center, black isn't just going to sit idly by as white plays bishop to a4 and just threatens serious things like maybe winning material. So a5 is not played with the thought that white's going to get some sort of positional, positional grind fest on the, on the queen side here. No, a5 is played anticipating exactly what Svidler did, which is to blow open the center and then play knight to b4. Again, not allowing bishop to a4 to come in with the pin. Knight to b4 also threatens knight to d3, so white plays bishop a3. And now after d5, which was our first official novelty, is where things get really messy. And to Topolov said he felt that he was just already much, much better. Winning would be an extreme, but he felt that black was under some serious pressure. I would agree. 
And so the question is, if we back up and take a look at Fiddler's approach here, the two games he's had on the black side of this Lopez, this anti-Marshall Lopez, if you remember my description to the game where Vichy took Fiddler down, this A4 idea by White is an anti-Marshall gambit approach from White, not allowing D5. If you didn't, back up and check out that video. But if the question is, is Fiddler just not getting the position he needs to get as black in the Lopez, he's, is he going to have to switch back to playing the Berlin regularly? Um, because everything that happened from here on out was to Paul up in the driver's seat. He just took a few wrong turns here and there. But there really wasn't anything better. If Fiddler plays c5, this is a move that has been played before, not a, not, not a novelty, but after e5, White's attack ends up being almost just as strong. Knight f to d5, we'll see knight to e4. And after takes, takes, in the end of this line, the theory stops uh, at the game between Mortensen and Alander. Uh, which was a game played all the way back in 1993. But I took a look at it with the lizard by my side today. That's Komodo if you don't speak French. And we found that after queen f3, this pawn is actually untakeable. Uh, so white just has to be much better. Why? If queen takes, I can take on b4. And now you have only bad choices to make. If you take with the queen, you lose a piece. If you take with the knight, we're going to win f7 at the end of these lines by eliminating the bishop. And if you take with the rook, we go to fork town on the express train. So... Basically, I look at this anti marshal as really putting a hurt on Svidler's preparation. One of the only areas we've seen him out-prepared in the entire tournament, right? He's done the opposite when he's been white. Uh, but he lost that bad game to Vichy, and, and here he's, uh, he's under pressure again, even with the movie played D5. Topala played 95, and as he said, he already felt like Black was in big trouble. Why? Well, this D5 pawn is pinned, and that's one bishop two bishops too many, where black just doesn't have active moves he can make without serious consequences on the diagonals. After the move bishop to b7 and queen f3, we already have a concrete threat, and that is to play what he did in the game, knight takes f7 and e5. Now, it's kind of just a big fancy trade, not like white is winning material, but as things are opening up, you're seeing more and more every one of the black pieces is tied down. The knight and bishop are tied down to the pawn, the, the bishop here is tied down to defend the knight along with the rook, and without really any permanent, permanent targets in White's position to target, it's really easy to favor White here. Uh, in the game, Topala played rook takes e8 and then queen to c3, which we can't fault him for. He was eventually winning. But it should be noted, I analyzed, that you can take here whether trading rooks first or not, and then execute a relocation plan of the pony, which would put long-term pressure on d5. It's a position that, even there, I, I think that White is going to be the only one who can squeeze for a long time. So... That was also possible. After takes, takes, and queen to c3, we saw c5, which I gave an exclam to, even knowing this fiddler was still worse, because I felt like it was exactly the kind of thing you have to play in a position where you're getting outplayed. The evaluation is you're almost clearly worse. Again, you have a hard time moving any of these pieces. Rather than bringing the rook back to b8 and playing just slow, hope I don't lose to some tactic defense, you got to be practical, and you got to choose your, choose your opportunities to make it dynamic. And that's what black is doing here. C5, knight f3, rook to b8, and after knight to e5, takes d4, queen takes. The truth is, this is, a, this is another critical moment where white was still better after what Topalov did, but the line that I analyzed and the computers liked, which surprisingly wasn't really reviewed in detail in the post-game commentary, is the move f4, which anchors in the pony. And at first you think, isn't that a little bit risky? Well, it is, but, you know, hey, we like biscuits around here, so that's why we risk it. After rook to b5, rook to c1 stops the bishop from coming to c5 and threatens rook c8. And after bishop b7, I, I think there were several moves here, but I just threw out king h1 as a prophylactic measure and asked, asked black to find a move. Like literally find a move, right? Uh, the rook can't move, the bishop can't move, the knight can't move, this bishop can't move. There are The, the moves you have are queen e6 and queen f6. And although I'm not, I'm not saying that white has multiple tactical blows that just win the game on the spot, it's much, much easier to be white in a position where black is a tactical error away from the, the entire house of cards falling, right? It's, it's, it's a vulnerable situation for black. So I liked f4, uh, not Spither, Topala played bishop b2, which is also a good move and makes sense. Uh, it just, it allowed the end game, where I guess my approach was to keep the pressure and keep the queens on the board, asking black, how are you going to hold this position under time pressure with so many tactical chances to, to mess up? So that, that's why I, I do feel like f4 was better, and so did Komodo. But I shouldn't take anything away from the fact that Topolov was calculating accurately, and this end game was certainly winning for white with best play. After bishop takes e5, rook b5, bishop to d1, the move knight to d3 was played. Black probably needed to play knight to c6. 
Uh, but it should be noted that if just bishop to c7 is played, white is still in the driver's seat. We're going to anchor in that piece, kick the rook from the square, and then activate the rook. But after knight to d3 was played, unfortunately for Topalov, this is where he really missed his chance, which was funny because in the postgame commentary, both players said they saw bishop e2 and thought that, okay, it should be good for white, but didn't evaluate the concrete aspect of the line, which was that rookie one is just winning on the spot. It's a skewer of the knight and the e8 square, which is a, which is a fork. So actually, bishop to e2, which pins the knight, would almost be winning right away. Now, black can play the move rook to b3, which we analyzed. But after bishop takes d3 and rook to c1, king f7, we can check and check here. Now, we can't just win a piece, but by winning the clear pawn and likely the second pawn that falls next, there's no way white isn't... isn't I, I never want to say just easily winning. Whenever it's an obstacle bishop ending, there are so many different scenarios that can surprise you with blockades and the black king is active, but... But it's definitely good practical winning chances and probably the better than what he would have gotten in the game. Not probably, it was. So in the game, um, Topolov either saw the obstacle bishop opportunity, didn't think, feel like it was enough, or overestimated his chances here. Or as we said, just blundered the fact that after taking the rook in that line, we had a skewer. And that would have, that would have been Bob Gironka right there. So, But after bishop to c6, bishop to c2. Again, probably bishop to a4 is, is better for white. This was also not mentioned, but according to me and Komodo, I think this might have been white's last real chance to be winning to take and then pin the knight, which is really key because we get lines where the bishop gets to battle against the knight with the outside a pawn in, and we're definitely going to take white's chances in that endgame. So uh, I think bishop a4 was maybe the last concrete chance. Interesting to see the players just play so well. Time pressure affects everybody, though, right, even at the highest levels. In the game, instead, bishop to c2 was played, and after knight to f4, bishop e5, knight e2 check would have been the easiest draw for, uh, for black. Svither didn't see it. He played the move rook to c5, but after a few more moves, the position was still held by black, and, and white just didn't have enough to, to pull the trigger in the end. The bishop here gets a little messy here, but a, a fun line I looked at was that even if the move bishop a7 had been played, which was analyzed by some players as, as maybe another idea for white, it does skewer the knight to the pawn, which is a little better. But a nice line is that knight e6 guarding the pawn, bishop d5 can be met by bishop to c4, which is actually an x-ray defense, right? If, uh, if you take, I take with the bishop, and we have obstacle bishop ending. I mean, that pawn is just not going to be enough. It's just one pawn. If you take with the rook, I take here, and again, it's an obstacle bishop ending. And if you take a6, I play d3 and things might actually get a little tricky for white. So um, I think black was holding, even if bishop a7 had been played, which was a, which was a move mentioned in the postgame commentary. So in review, we've seen Svither come under pressure now twice, escape with only a half point out of two in both of these anti-marshals. Topalov, unfortunately, letting his first chance, his first real chance at a decisive uh, result in his favor for the whole tournament slip away here. Again, uh, backing up to this critical moment, at least right here, where where bishop to e2 was not played. So we're going to leave it at that for these two these two pros who've, who've done this before and move on to a game between two two of the younger players, or middle middle of the road, I guess, age players as far as the total, the average age of the tournament. That's between Hikaru Nakamura and Sergei Karyakin. And let's, let's not waste any more time to jump right into another Queen's Indian. Now there really shouldn't be much analysis needed of the of the opening stage here as we as we move in because we've seen this Queen's Indian almost umpteen times now. Pretty much every time Karyakin sat down, we've seen one as white and black. And here we see Nakamura repeat the game between Karyakin and Topala with the move rook to b1. Now at first, think nothing of it, right? We've seen knight to e5 played by Geary against Karyakin, where we were very impressed by the the, the Russians' prep. We've seen A3 played by Caruana, which maybe has put uh, Karyakin under more pressure than any other game, at least until this one. Uh, we also saw the, him play this position as white against Akara Nakamura, where he chose queen to c2. And, and uh, now we see rook to b1 played for the second time by Hikaru. And the idea is exactly the one that was highlighted in the analysis by Maxime vache le in the written news report of the game of the day, which is that White wants to play for b4 and a4 and expand the queen side, potentially putting both a stop to the natural break of c5, which is what black wants in all these queens Indians, as we know, and, and gaining space before taking action in the center. 
Now, a line was analyzed by Maxime. I don't need to tell you what it was because it's exactly what was played in the game. After knight b to d7, the move b4 was played. Now, if you remember, after rook to b1, Karyakin played c5. So as, as we evaluated, the whole idea of rook b1 is to play b4 to prevent c5 and gain the space on the queen side. In that game against Apollo, Karyakin said, no, thank you. I'll strike immediately. And that's exactly what we had, right? In, in the game, you can back up and see both my review from the previous video or check out the news report. But the line that was analyzed in the news report was that if knight bd7 is played, white's going to play b4. And in the variation that follows in this game, MVL analyzed it and said that white's probably a little bit better. Well, here's the, here's the idea. The bishop comes to c4. And after bishop f4, White is threatening to play knight to d2, and black might have some serious issues. If you just make some sort of random passive move, what you'll find is that the bishop is under target. This has been opened. And if black is losing the bishop pair and coming under fire on the long diagonal, he's, this is exactly what you don't want in a queen's Indian. White's just going to be better. So black has to play knight e4 to stop knight to d2. Well, now, after knight takes e4 in here, we're winning this pawn in exchange for the a pawn seems like it should be an advantage for white and that's what mvl said after bishop takes here takes b1 queen takes b1 which is a fork and one that is going to want to see black actually give up the exchange not the h7 pawn because of an attack on the king so after knight f6 guarding the h7 pawn we take a8 white plays e4 and again this it's funny we don't i don't know how closely hikaru is following the news reports or or whether this is just something that uh, both players had already analyzed ahead of time, and MVL, being a player of their level, also anticipated that this might be a critical line at some point. Either way, whether the chicken or the egg came first, it doesn't matter, because this is, it was just a funny observation. And now, unfortunately for Hikaru, after really a simple move here, he said he felt, he felt kind of thrown off already, which is frustrating when you, when you feel like a very natural move by your opponent is a move you didn't know was a good move, or you didn't have it prepared, or didn't see it coming. So... Uh, it makes you feel a little bit irritated with your own prep when, when it's such a natural move and you're like, well, duh, right? So in the game, Hikaru played bishop e3, though, which is fine. But probably in this critical moment, after this whole psych psychological pressure that we're talking about, where a natural move pl was played and it's a good one, so surprise to Hikaru, uh, I think rook to c1 might have been the best chance. Now, Hikaru said he looked at takes, takes, and rook d7, seemingly equalizing but I, I went a little further, and I was wondering, why isn't e5 at least winning chances for white, if not, if not a little better, uh, right away? You can't move the knight because I win the rook. You have to take, and we're going to get a two pieces for a rook position, whether you like it or not. If I want to eliminate ideas on the e-file, I can immediately back up the bishop to e3, which is safe. Also goes here. Maybe I can establish b5. Uh, more aggressive moves might be things like knight to c4 for white. And, okay, it, it's hard to say that white has serious winning chances here it's it, that's just not true because the you have a rook and a pawn for the two pieces with almost nothing else on the board but that dynamic and there's just not a lot to target but i would say that white's in the driver's seat at least and so i, I was kind of surprised that that line wasn't mentioned in the post game commentary whether it was played or not uh time will tell if we see this line again and maybe white goes for that maybe somebody tries to improve upon these two players but Hikaru played them with bishop e3, the other way to defend the pawn, instead of defending with counterplay. He defends with, with good old-fashioned buckle-down d. And after knight to g4, he's going to lose the bishop pair, but perhaps his last real chance for an advantage was, was right here when he played the move h3. Kind of a dubious idea, just from the perspective that it's slow, and black's probably going to have to take here anyway. So MVL and I, and I uh, actually talking about this game on Skype, we both looked at the move knight to f3 which uh, is no surprise. It was also mentioned by Karyakin in the post-game uh, conference. And after c5 takes, takes, and d5, we get this position here, which at first seems a little unclear, but I actually think if, if anybody has winning chances here, it's going to be white. I like the move knight to d2 and followed by queen a2, not knight to c4, but queen a2, threatening the move d6 check to win the bishop, and then immediately sliding the rook over to a1. Um, Black, Black is going to look for counterplay as well on both the B-file and against the E-pawn, but if anybody has winning chances in this endgame, it's white. So I wonder what it was about knight f3 that was either underestimated or about the structure forcing the, the exchange that was overestimated by Hikaru. It's very clear that white wants threats on the F-file, so that part of it makes sense. And perhaps the move knight f3 was dismissed because 
of worries that these tactics weren't going to be as easy to get. But I think from the positional perspective, we can see that if White did eventually get this blockade on the light squares, as I highlighted with the knight versus the bishop, then you can't be anything but happy. So, so in hindsight, I would say both rook to c1 on move 20 and move knight f3 on move 21 were potential improvements for the American. But he didn't. He played h3. And that might have been all we wrote right there. Yes, uh, during the game, of course, we're all excited and there's the chance that somebody might play for the win. Now it's kind of getting messy. Maybe Karyakin can push. But what we realize is really the only chance he had to push was right here. Instead of playing the very sharp and very forcing simplification, he needed to play the move queen h5, guarding f7 from the, from the checks. Uh, went after d5 and rook to b8. Black is probably a little bit better. He wants to prove that these two pawns with the, with the help of the rook will be better than white central pass pawns and blockade. I think that black is a little better here. Best play, um, maybe white can play king to g2, g4, try to force the queen to a more passive square to stay on the pawn, and then, and then maybe try to advance e5 because the queen isn't on it. I actually looked at it for a long time with Komodo because apparently I have nothing else to do with my life. Uh, I think white's okay, but, but black is definitely a little better. So that move wasn't played. Instead, Karyakin took on d4, calculated queen takes f7, and either underestimated h4 or, or thought he was just ready for the draw because in this position, there's nothing else black can expect. Queen takes e4, rook f4, and this is all pretty much forced. Now he has to deal with the back rank threats. Uh, as soon as this bishop is taken, black's going to win the knight, so don't get, uh, don't get too excited over there. I see you sitting there in your chair. Don't get too excited. After takes d4, we get b5, and... Uh, Nakamura makes the right choice to save the knight and not just trade right away. At least it's the last chance for winning chances. And you always hope, of course, for some smothered mate, right? Who doesn't? We can all dream. After the bishop moves queen d5, we get a check town, a trade town, and then it's really just a matter of who's going to give up the perpetual first. In this case, they decided to trade the e for the b pawn, which was another road to get to Rome, a peaceful result. And uh, another Queen's Indian. So what have we learned? Well, Karyakin doesn't lose in the Queen's Indian, apparently. But we also learned that if you're not paying attention to MVL's analysis at, uh, at the news reports, then either you don't realize that he's actually on the cutting edge theory with these top guys, because this was literally what he analyzed, which wasn't anywhere before this, or they're following it and they're using his analysis. Either way, it's fun. And with that, let's move on to the game that was certainly my favorite of the day, where, where the man from India, Vishy, does it again and is just on, on, a, on a path right now. He seems to be poised to be the best one with the chance at a rematch for Carlson, to be honest, right now as we head to the last few rounds of the tournament. But I'm, I'm going to let you decide that. I, let, just let me show you his win over co-tournament leader heading into the round, Levon Aronian. Now, exactly why this wasn't the game of the day after such an awesome win by Vichy had nothing to do with the fact that, it, it well, as I already said, it was kind of my game of the day, and I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, but we had to choose, and Geary's game with Caruana was, was very exciting, and the truth is Geary should have won. For a long time, I think it felt like definitely going to be the game of the day, and you're going to see that when you look at this, that it was sort of surprising how, uh, how many winning chances Vichy was able to generate in the end game that seemed like it might just be headed to a rook ending draw. But again, let's let's stop talking about it and just show it. We have an Italian, right? Everyone loves a, a good Italian here. And after c3, a6, a4, we have very typical Italian stuff. Again, what happens is both sides try to keep the bishops on the critical diagonals and wait for their opportunity to create tension and strike in the center. Pretty typical stuff. After knight a3, and then knight to c2. The knight has, has Rui Lopez type visions of maybe coming to e3 in some positions. It also supports d4. Just very solid, very natural stuff. Theoretically, the move knight to e7 was, a, was already a novelty, trying to mix it up a little bit. But the ideas are very, uh, very common. Knight to g6, bishop to e3, castles. After we get a trade, as we said, this knight is going to come to e3. Knight to g4, queen d2. D4, I think all these moves make a lot of sense, right? Both sides developing their pieces, getting castled. It's just like you would ask a beginner to play chess. We're expanding in the center. And uh, it, it, D4 is exactly the kind of thing you always want to see in the, the Italian. As long as there's not tactical consequences against your e-pawn, this, this structure here is exactly what you want to see with the pawn on C3 right in the middle, supporting the potential for for more space, which of course will lead to more powerful pieces and better tactics. So this is just uh, typical stuff, and, and Vichy was right at home. Now after rook a8 takes, knight takes, we get the trade and the bishop retreats. There's really nothing to report home about seriously. 
I think until right here, where Vichy already starts to show from here on out that he had a little bit of a better feel for the potential of the position than his opponent. Now, I think they both calculated pretty well, at least till the end game, where unfortunately LeVon got caught up in some back-to-back -back errors, one leading to another. But the reason I highlight the feel for the position is because I think that one of the one of the ways these top players can still outplay each other, the rare ways, right? When they they're all so well prepared, they calculate like geniuses, very few mistakes made, and and so how do they outplay each other? Well, when you get a position that you're a little more comfortable in than your opponent, or maybe you you just have a lot of experience, you're aware of their their existing subtle winning chances in places where maybe they look at it and think it's kind of just equal or kind of just a draw. So as the person playing with the black pieces, they're settled on making certain exchanges and getting to an endgame where they're thinking, okay, this can't be too bad, right? But if you but if you are a little more comfortable or if you feel like the winning chances are are practical in nature that at least you can keep pushing, then you can go for those positions and slowly outplay them and let one little mistake lead to a slightly bigger mistake till eventually it's too late. And that whole psychology is something people should apply to their own chess games. It's the reason you want to commit to an opening repertoire and not just bounce around your whole life. Because the more you play certain positions and the structure and the common tactics that occur in those middle games and the common end games that occur from those tactical middle games and, and, and you get experience in seeing, you end, up, you end up being able to see the forest through the trees where your opponent cannot. So I'm sorry for the rant, but I like to take the moments to give you whatever educational tips and advice I can. And so committing to positions you know well, I think, allows you to see, as I said, the bigger picture where your opponent sees just as many trees and maybe sees them just as clearly as you do, but might miss certain other things. And, and so here after F3, it, uh, Vichy shows he's very calm and very patient and uh, waiting for a track to explode on, as Eminem would say. And I'm sure he's a big fan. I'm sure Vichy's a huge fan of Eminem, I would bet, right? After rook f to d1, knight to c5, b4, what was what was interesting in the comments made, after bishop b3, knight f6, and queen to d4, Aronian was commenting that he doesn't think white has much here, uh, but but I think Anon is, is, has the perspective that maybe white's chances are being underestimated. What's going to happen? A huge trade of almost all the pieces on the board. The knights are coming off, the queens are coming off, and the bishops are probably going to come off at some point here too. But... What is what happens in what's going on in this position? Well, if White ever takes here, there's a very good chance they're going to be left with a permanently huge problem on on c7. In fact, on that note, I feel like I skipped a critical line that's worthy of mentioning, and I'm going to back up and show it right here. That in in the position where instead of queen to e7, sorry, I analyzed a lot of lines, so let me find it. After knight to d5 takes and takes, bishop a7. B5, bishop, B7, C4 here. So in this position, we, we, we're going to see a key tactical moment that shows you the danger of black's position. The, Aronian said he had analyzed bishop takes D5, as, as Anon did. And after takes, it seems like black can coordinate everything to defend C7 in just the right amount of time. The rooks get over. I get tripled up. You get everybody on the, on the pawn. So is white really threatening anything here? No, right? Wrong. White is threatening something. That's the move rook takes b6. And after takes, we have rook to c8, crushing through. And because of that threat, if black has to play the move queen to b8, now we have a new threat that didn't exist with the queen and rook battery both guarding the d-file. That's e5, exclam. If you take with the rook, I crash through immediately. If you take with the pawn, just to show you, I crash through with d6. So. A big space advantage can turn structures that seem symmetrical into tactical, uh, tactical, I would say, minefields, where there's lots of places to step on things that might blow up in your face, right? So, yeah, the position seems symmetrical. Maybe there's only a few weaknesses on the board, but never underestimate an, a significant space advantage for your opponent because it allows them to put their pieces on more active squares. And, and whenever someone has pawns further advanced in an endgame, that's when you see all those little pawn sacks break through, right? You sack the middle one, you sack the end, the three little pigs trick. Everyone has seen positions where we're reminded of the principle, it's not how many pawns you have left, but who queens first. And when your opponent has a huge space advantage with pawns, those kinds of tactics you just saw with e5 and d6 exist commonly. It's not just some random freak coincidence. So be aware of that. And I think that that's just part of the winning chances you should recognize. And that's part of the reason that Aronian played queen e5. 
But again, after what happened in the game, if we take stock, still, white still has a big space advantage. No, these breakthroughs aren't exactly going to occur without, without a little bit of help by black. But already, if you start with the move f4, and then look at the move rook, f, rook to c3 to swing, you start to see that the space advantage with a combination of playing tickle to try to create some weaknesses on the pawns is going to create some open lines for these rooks to get in at. Now, Vichy didn't play f4. He actually played king f2, which is probably not as good as the move we just mentioned f4. But the ideas of playing f4, letting the rook swing, and trying to get the king to enter is exactly what Vichy's going to do. And even though black plays what seem to be pretty solid moves here, as you see, uh, he's going to defend things here. The rooks and kings are just going to kind of wait and go back and forth. But all of a sudden, we're right in this position here. And already, the, the chances of white winning have gone way up especially after this last move. I, I want to I pause and take stock that everything I talked about with Vichy's position, the space advantage, don't estimate the little things, look for the pawn breakthroughs in these end games, all that stuff. And, and Vichy's overall, I think, feeling that White had more winning chances than Aroni and maybe gave him credit for. Um, that all led to this position and maybe Aronian's move without him really sensing the danger of this, of this king walk that was about to happen. In the game, he played rook 88, as you've already seen, I played it. He should have played king to e8 and brought the king over to the king side to meet the white king. Now, it, white is still a little bit better, but after h5, which is a very good move pointed out by Vichy, suddenly this king is actually trapped in some positions. And some funny lines I'll point out are that, like if rook to d3 and h4 and the rook comes over, if white continues to stay overly aggressive, Look at this move, rook back to e8, and how do you stop rook e5 check? That king has come a little bit too far for his own good. And after rook e5 check, you're going to see takes and takes with check, king f4, and black picks up this rook and is doing absolutely fine. So that was a line to show that at the very least, the kings are doing better for black when they've met each other. So black is defending the entry points. And I think overall, there's a better chance to kept, catch white in so, sort of an uncoordinated misstep with the rooks, as we just saw. But in the game... Uh, again, rook a8 cannot be considered a losing move, but I think it was the first step in the really wrong direction. After king to g4, we see the e-pawn sacrifice for the g-pawn, but the main point is I have entry ways that you don't, and that's going to make a huge difference. After rook to d2, king to b8, this was a move criticized heavily by uh, Levon himself of his own play. It was move 40, uh, but definitely the king going to b8, he was, he was afraid of this move. The threat here... For example, if rook takes a4 is the move rook to c2, and that's lights out. So actually, if you're wondering why didn't black take the pawn, that's why. So black knows that that's coming, so he plays the move king to b8, so that after rook to c2, as in the game, he can defend the pawn. But there was no reason to just play that move quickly to stop just that threat. The king should have definitely been on b7 instead of b8. And as you're going to see later on, when black starts to get his own counterplay, just the one tempo for the king and the ability to maybe play c6 to open a play would have been huge. So... Uh, a move that quickly stops a threat, but, but, but has some lack of foresight. And again, those things happen when you've already been playing for a long time, maybe thinking that the position should probably just be a draw with best play. Never feel like you're in a comfort zone where, okay, you know, my opponent's pushing because it's just like the ethical thing to do, or he's doing it for the fans or whatever, but there's not really real winning chances here. They don't have these thoughts, but we're all humans, and I think sometimes when you feel like you equalize very early, you can play moves for a long time without sensing the danger. And again, now after king to b8, rook c2, exclam, gains a tempo, forces rook c8, and here comes, here comes the king. We guard the a-pawn and king f5, and this position is already lost for black. Just like that. Vichy lets him back in with a small mistake, but ultimately wins with the same idea. And so where could he have done better? Well, king to b7 being the last shot. Uh, note that, again, rook e7 does not work as a way to guard the 7th rank because you'll just trade and enter immediately, and that king is just so dominant compared to his counterpart. Uh, and so the truth is this is already bad news, you know, bad news bears for black, and, and not the good one with Walter, Walter Mathau, the bad one with Billy Bob Thornton, you know. So after g3, rook to c4, Anand gave this move credit, thinking it was a really nice idea, but uh, I think he was being nice because I think Black has just lost. After takes, our two pawns are a lot faster than his. And here's a perfect example where if the king was on b7, you might already play c5, where your true pawns are just as fast, or he en passant and gets your king out. It might make a big difference. And here's, here's where Anand made his last blunder. He goes on to win the game anyway, so I'm not going to uh, delve into it too much, but, but it really could have been critical. 
For some reason, he decides the G pawn is the way to go. Instead of realizing that if he plays king to G5 and clears the H file, I think black resigns pretty quickly. Those pawns are running, and uh, the king is that much farther away from it. The rook is that much more awkward to stop it, and I think it's over. So that, that would have been the fastest approach, but after king h5, d4, and then king to c8, at this point, Anand admitted he, he, he had messed up. He's like, at this point, I realized, all right, this isn't so easy anymore. And after g5, uh, the sacrifice of the h-pawn is sort of forced in order to come forward. Uh, note that, that the, the major point is that if you play g6, that actually takes away important entry points for the king. And one critical line I, I analyzed was something like this, where if you come forward too far, ouch town, white loses. If you play g7, I blockade. Uh, and so, and if you check, I just put the king on g8. So the g6 pawn is actually blocking the king to have squares that he needs. Uh, that, that's the reason why he doesn't do that and, in fact, plays king to g6. But after rook takes h4 and some tricky moves with the king, uh, the last chance being here instead of rook to c4, but just put the king there immediately. It, it's hard for me to, to, to really judge Levon. This, is a, this would be a really tough one to defend, and it's actually based on this idea of running the king out and then sacrificing the rook for the pawn. And, um, and if white goes for it all the way, it actually becomes one of these real messes where, where pawns race against the rook, and, and me and Komodo went for it for a long time. I mean, it got weird between us. I feel like I'm getting really close to this really massive reptile. And uh, anyway, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother issue. But um, may maybe because it was so tr tricky for Anon, maybe he'll just repeat the moves and, and uh, just take the draw right here instead of going for those long lines. But that didn't happen. So with Vichy having blown the win, not playing King G5 in the H pawn, now uh, Levon blows the draw by not playing the move Rook to C, uh, not playing the move King F8, but Rook to C4. And now the difference is we play King to G7. Always remember King position over over the Rook check because you want that King to have to be moved out, and and that's what makes the difference for White. And here we have a very classical win. Always fun to see a Lucina in action where the rook comes up to the bridge, blocking the other rook's attacking chances, and with it, forcing the pawn through. Levon tried one cute trick with rook takes g7, but after rook to d5 check, it was over. Uh, the only idea was that if takes, and if you go here, if the rook has to come back, maybe you can play here and get counterplay. I think white's winning anyway, but, but rook d5 just, just made it really simple because now it's no longer an option. So Aronian resigned, and with that, we had this huge shakeup with Vichy jumping back in, and already we're moving on to the game of, di game of the day between Geary and Caruana. Let's jump right in. And once again, of course, we must, uh, must give credit where credit is due, that being to MVL and his uh, game of the day analysis, which, of course, is in full at chess.com. So go check it out there. We're going we're gonna to dive in immediately, wasting no more time, and this was an exciting Grunfeld. We haven't seen, we haven't seen this opening yet, I think, I think for the entire term, maybe one other time from, from Peter Svidler, but certainly not the F3 variation. Uh, wh what are the main dynamics here? Well, white has a big center that black has gambited. Black has gambited the big center to white so that he now has something to attack, right? It's like giving your older brother a candy bar, so now you have something to complain about and, and try to take from him for the rest of the afternoon. So that's kind of what the Grunfeld is. And uh, Black is going to be developing to put pressure in the center, strike and open it up, while White tries to maintain it and use the space advantage that is restricting Black's pieces for either usually a kingside attack or for eventually a transition to an endgame where, where you have one of these pawns, usually the deep pawn, becoming some sort of passer. So that's me, that's my 32nd, what are the dynamic ideas for both sides in the Grunfeld? There you go. After knight c3, bishop g7, bishop e3, these are the things you're going to see. Here comes e5, and after d5, c6, it's exactly what we said. White has the center, white has the space, but black is going to be undermining it from now until kingdom come. And here's where it gets fun. White plays h4. This is one of the most enjoyable lines in the Grunfeld to watch and to play. It's, it's, all, it's all out, right? White is, white is essentially five moves away from checkmating black. But he can't just play all five of those moves because black is going to be playing as aggressive moves over here in the center. Now, after takes d5 and trade and knight a6, you're getting the balance we've talked about. If you give black three to five moves, what do they look like? Knight to b4, bishop f5, rook to c8, maybe I take d5, maybe I go to check town, right? Maybe we play a little how's your father, and then we, we make the king get on the run. 
It's important to understand that imagining what you would do with your next three to five moves, not just I'd take here, take here, take here, go here, take there, and then checkmate. Like not, not something ridiculous, but just taking the time to calculate a few moves ahead, what you would do in your ideal scenarios is important. It always keeps you sort of in check with this is how I'm trying to improve my position. And, um, and it's not, not a waste of time to do that. So good to understand what black wants with five moves. If white want gets five moves, we were playing H5. We're trading, we're opening the H file, we're bringing the queen and rook battery together for a relationship that works. So that's what white starts with with H5. And after knight to B4, we're headed exactly to the things we talked about. And this is where it gets really fun. Takes G6 is played instead of bishop H6, which makes sense. Black can maybe take right away and give check here and the rook's hanging and white better checkmate black or, or he doesn't have enough. Uh, but after takes and bishop f5, this position is, is really fun because you see black having gambited two of the king's side pawns, but getting the full initiative he could ever want. White's h-file has actually closed down because of his own pawn in the way, right? We've talked about this. It's the umbrella method defense where you put the other person's pawn in front of your king and, and they wish they could get rid of their own pawn, but they can't. Uh, we talked about that in Nakamura's loss to Caruana. So, so now the black king is safer and his attack is starting. After rook to d1, knight c2, check, and king up, the initial thinking of this position is, I kind of like black. You've got the bishop pair. The two pawns aren't a, too, a huge worry to me because I feel like this king surviving on the dark floors for the next umpteen moves, probably not possible. But what we saw here was, unfortunately, right at the end of his preparation for Fabiano, he, he, makes, he makes a few critical errors in, in, in judgment. And it starts with the move, not bishop to d7, that's okay, although it prepared a plan that was wrong. But with the next move with f5, he underestimates, one, the weakness to his own king's position by pushing the f-pawn. There's a square on g6 that if I was playing bug house, that'd be a pretty happy square to drop a pony on, if you know what I'm saying. But it's also not the most effective way to attack the king. The best way to do that was rook to c8. Now, if you put the rook on c8 immediately, the point is that you're, you're, you're threatening ideas of knight a4, which are, are intended to do exactly what you think they are, evil intentions along the c-file. And that's what, that's what Caruana needed to do to keep the, uh, the, the, the balance properly for the gambit and also to avoid exactly the kind of things that should have lost the game for him. But he played f5, and Geary played a very nice move, f4 which at first is, seems kind of scary, right? Aren't you voluntarily opening the beast, right? You're, you're inviting the dragon. But it actually puts a stop to Black's plan of f4 and points out to Black that if you do nothing, I might just take and bring my own knight in. And, and again, we've been talking about this g6 square. So in the game, after rook to c8, g3, supporting this blockade of the counterplay, uh, Caruana makes his second mistake and probably should have never had an opportunity in the game to come back from it. He doesn't play knight a4, which was said by Geary also in the post-game conference, that it just makes more sense for, for black. Open up the file, maybe give check on d2 first, but even if you just take it, this is the kind of position that's going to get really scary for white and uh, be difficult to coordinate everybody and keep the king safe for several moves. Forget about the two-pawn advantage because they're just not an issue yet. And, and that's where the balance is maintained dynamically. But after knight to c4, just too much for black disappears. Takes and takes, and the, the concrete threat of knight f4, knight g6 checkmate forces a third pawn to be sacrificed. It's literally the only move that stops this idea of knight f4, and I'm just coming in. And I don't know if you've noticed, but white has two connected pass pawns on the fifth rank in this position, and he's up three pawns. Uh, actually, in this position, white's up four pawns. It's, it's an absolute mess right now. And as long as white finds the accurate moves from here from here moving forward, this game should be a win. And, and I was tweeting about it. If you, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you should do so right there. It says, at Daniel Wrench, right above me. Go ahead and subscribe and follow me on Twitter. But I was tweeting about it during the live tournament and saying that this looks like the win for Geary. Several moves here were a little better than what he did. And... I'm going to make a statement here, which I think sets the tone for how we see Geary sort of let the advantage go in this game. It's very easy when you're, you've got a big material advantage and your king is wide open to go into, well, now how I win this game is I just, I, I trade the pieces, simplify it, even if I have to give a little bit back, because as long as my king is safe, there's no way four pawns aren't going to win. And it's easy to do that. 
not to say that in a lot of practical scenarios, it may not be the right decision, right? You want to simplify when you're just that much up on material. But I like to use the term keep it simple, not simplify. And that implies that you're not always just trading. You're doing what, what keeps the balance of the position the most in your favor. Often, if you're up a rook, then yeah, any trade is keeping it simple. But sometimes keeping it simple is not forcing trades. Here in this game, I think that Gary didn't win because he was he was trying to play like a human too much. He was trying to play the practical. Let me just simplify. Let's just get the pieces off the board. Come on, I just want my king safe so I can queen a pawn, right? Come on, help a guy out. But Caruana never let it happen. He never let the position uh, get as simple as Gary wanted. And after one pawn, one pawn, one pawn, and another falling, eventually the advantage slipped. So that's just a practical point to take home and, and remember it for your own games. Just don't don't be afraid to be accurate and concrete. The best move here was the surprising king to e1. Unpin the knight, renew the concrete threats on g6, and the e5 pawn is practically poisoned. Why? Well, it, after bishop g4, the knight can move to e4, and now the queen is being overwhelmed as far as the squares here. Rook takes e4, queen takes e4 is, is going to be enough for white as well. So if they take on e5, we have knight to g6, queen takes and queen takes e5. The queen trade is forced, and now the very nice maneuver, rook to d2, followed by executing on the e-file, still has white up three pawns, and, and should, should there have more than enough to win, because there you simplified enough with the queens coming off the board. So in the game, Geary tries to simplify with the rooks and, and willingly sacrifices this e-pawn. Doesn't, doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to see that. But after queen to b4 and rook f7 realizes, okay, it's a little too dangerous for me to get any more, so now I'll, I'll keep defending. And within a few moves, all of a sudden, black's pieces are kind of optim optimally coordinated. And another pawn falls in just a moment where Geary starts feeling the pressure on the C file and kind of panics again, gives up the D6 pawn. Still, white should be winning here after queen to D5, rook F7, king G2. It doesn't look like we're headed towards something that should have blown it that much. But if, you're asked, if you ask anybody, do you like this position compared to the one that was pretty much exactly the same for your king, but you had two pass pawns? I think we all know what we prefer. And don't underestimate already how much better Caruana is probably feeling at this point about his chances. Practical things like that make a huge difference. After rook h5 and then rook h6, Geary simplifies further, but with it, he's likely going to lose the h pawn. Queen to c6 check forces knight to d5. With the h-pawn falling, you still look at the position as, huh, don't I have an open king and the two knights, but we've just gone from being up four pawns to only being up one, and pretty much our king is still in just as much danger, and the bishop pair still exists for our opponent. So it just shows that you can't always, you know, back your way through the door when you're already winning. Sometimes you have to just, you know, face the music and, and try to calculate as concretely as possible. Don't let your opponent off the hook. And again, I just I, my criticism would only be that it seemed like White was trying too hard to, to simplify it in a human way and didn't calculate moves like King to E1 when White had the chance. So, so now we get a whole bunch of checks, and I'm going to say you should spend a whole bunch of time analyzing MBL's analysis and whether or not White was still winning. But after, after more, than, more than a few moves here, literally this game lasted 90-plus moves, what you're going to see is a position where the Queens and Knights were unable to prove access to the squares better than the queens and the bishops at least not without the king getting in trouble and the game eventually after a whole lot of time we finally get the bishop pair off the board but now guess what you're only up a pawn and black's probably in a pretty good position to go get counterplay as he's doing right now a million and a half checks later believe it or not I, i'm almost not exaggerating with a million and a half checks later we eventually had a draw claim with Carwana recognizing the uh the act the threefold repetition actually and with, even with the g-pawn, it's just not enough for Geary. The moment he's going to lose sight of that, either this bishop is going to gang up here or the, the, the black queen will open up for perpetual. So in this position, after it being repeated several times, as you can see, Caruana simply claimed a draw. And uh, we had the, the full point, the, the result that, that wasn't for Geary as far as a very good tournament, very solid tournament so far. But... Failing to convert on this one, we're talking a plus three advantage in that critical moment, uh, even according to the engines, is, is definitely hurts. And it's one you got to let go of and move on. Luckily for him, there's a rest day tomorrow. And on that point, let's move over and check on the standings. Shall we see, of course, that we still have Karyakin there at the top, but now a new leader swinging, swinging big punches is the Tiger. 
and he's got five and a half out of nine. That's, of course, Vichy and non. Fabiano Caruana and Aronian are right there. Obviously, Caruana saving that huge draw. Otherwise, you'd see Geary with five, and Caruana still with four and a half. So that's a, that's a big difference in the standings. Caruana still right there. Nakamura and Topalov near the bottom right now, both not having their best tournaments, unfortunately, for those two guys. Round 10 pairing, pairings, as you can see, we got Spidler, Naka, Karyak and Geary, Karwana, Vichy, Levon versus Topalov. And again, that can be seen on March 23rd. You can watch it at worldchess.com, the official website. That's round 10. I enjoyed this. I hope you all are enjoying the videos and the analysis at chess.com backslash news. Peace out. I'm getting exhausted. If you can't tell yet, this tournament is taking it out of me. Can you see that I've aged like 72 years in the last, I feel like Obama right now, you know, really, really, uh, really getting those gray hairs out. But thanks for watching. Peace out. And uh, we'll see you on chess.com.